Hey guys, welcome to episode 2 of my campaign recap. Let's just start off this time with a script. That way I actually know what I'm talking about in the order I'm talking about it. So last we left off, party was heading... Uh, let me get my little pen here, there it is. Alright, party, party was heading this way-ish, up the ocean. So remember how I said that uh, mystics are bad? Um, they, it, was, it was so bad... And I don't like killing off characters um, in general, but I, I especially don't like killing off characters so that I for like to get rid of the overpowered character. Okay, I got rid of the mystic. Um, I talked to the player. I I think we both agreed that the mystic was a little. I mean, I I I feel like unfun to experience as the DM, and I think a little bit unfun to experience as the players because they're so far under powered comparatively um, that it takes away from some of the fun um, I know a lot of I know a couple of the players felt like they didn't have really much of an impact in combat and they were really just kind of wasting time waiting for Typhon and our barbarian to kind of handle the fight for them and that's no fun uh, especially if you like the combat uh, that's that that kind of ruins the juice for you um, so we got rid of him so it was also a good time for me to kind of introduce a little bit more narrative stuff. So on the way, on the boat, and I'm going to draw the boat right there it is. Oh, yeah. There we go. And there's Typhon, the man that goes away. Um, so the boat is heading this way. Uh, on the way, however, they are uh, a sky dragon, which is, again, from the Tome of Beasts. But I changed it a little bit to suit my own needs. Um, catches them. Uh, mid, out in the middle of the ocean, they're thinking, oh my god, it's a dragon, but it turns out there's two people riding it. One, uh, whose name is, I think it is Benwin. Uh, Benwin, who's a high elf. Um, he's also uh, referred to as Death. He's one of the four horsemen in my game. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, more than a minute. Uh, he drops off this new guy, Jethro. Typhon was gone from the previous episode, so the wizard in the tower, whose name was Renwald, took Typhon with him to have Typhon teach him some of his mystic's ability, which is a great way to get rid of the character in, in a narrative sense, other than, you know, rocks fall and they die. Um, so Typhon's off with Renwald, and Renwald sends this guy, Death, to bring uh, Jethro danger, danger. You can kind of get an idea of... <laughs> <laughs> of this of this player at this point. Uh, um, so Jethro Danger Danger. His I think I'm not sure if his middle name is Danger or it's just or it is Danger in quotes. So I'm not sure if it's a nickname or actually his middle name. Um, I think that's left up to the imagination. But he gets dropped off at the party, and Jethro basically explains that he has some kind of debt to Renwald that he's repaying by helping them do whatever it is they do. Um, so they head to Evertide, and they meet um, they meet our tiefling Adelaide's family, who own most of the town. Uh, the town, the village was pretty much nothing uh, until they showed up, and they're the Cofflers. They own a textile um, empire, pretty much. Um, very, very wealthy. They own most of the buildings in town, other than there is there isn't a lord of the city, but it's not the Cofflers, because the lord was there first. And the lord and the Cofflers kind of scuffle a little bit, because the Cofflers have a whole lot more money and actual influence in the town, since they own most of the stuff, and the lord has political power. Uh, so they go over to Tide. Uh, they hang around a bit. Uh, they drop off their ship, which they acquired from the Acadian Islands. They have a boat. I think they named it the Unsinkable 2. Um... Cause screw me, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think they head the same way they did before, past the Broken Tower, um, to Deer Grave, and then from Deer Grave to Water's Edge. Uh, in Water's Edge, we refer to yes. In Water's Edge, they find out that there is a the Grand Tournament is going on in a, a few weeks, uh, a few weeks to like a month and a half or so. And the Grand Tournament is kind of like this world's Olympics. It happens every five years, and it's got jousting and. Uh, archery, drinking contests, eating contests, um, horseshoes, one-on-one -on -one combat, group combat. Um, it's basically like a, a way for the other nation states of the human empire and the elves and the dragonborn and all the other races to kind of come and compete on equal footing, um, see who's the best. It's, it's the Olympics, more or less. It's like a much more violent version of the Olympics. Um, and I think that went, went quite well. So 
during so there's qualifying qualifiers to get you in kind of like uh anything else you have to have a qualifying match for so that's being held in water's edge when they arrive um their old friend captain amber who won uh five years ago with the single combat is there and he um he's one of the judges they end up doing some single combat versus each other the party fights each other to, to qualify um a couple of them qualify and do pretty well uh, the group qualifies they win um uh, after the tournament and everything, Amber calls them back to his mansion. Uh, he is the battle master for Water's Edge, so he's in charge of the military, not the City Watch. That's a different person. He's in charge of, like, the the standing army for Water's Edge. Um, and he's done a pretty good... He's famous for having driven off... Or, oh, let me get the pen again. He's, so there's a lot... This used to be pretty heavy orc kingdom. Um, a horde sort of started growing, radiating it out. This was... Not that long ago, but long enough ago. Uh, it's what made Amber famous, is he kind of fended off the uh, encroaching orcs and drove them back. So now the uh, the orcs are pretty much uh, not in this area anymore. They still harry this area. Kinnelin still gets pretty fucked up, and these hills and mountains are also um, somewhat teeming, but mostly it's, it's a lot of infighting since they lost the big push. Um... So they find out that, uh, and again, my world is, is fairly low magic, and, and magic would be rare. I'm just drawing a circle here, ignore that. Magic would be fairly rare. Uh, but they learn that since Renwald, that wizard, has left the Acadian Islands and they dropped that barrier, uh, magic has been starting to bleed back into the world. Um, so that's odd. Uh, Amber explains to them that things are getting weird. He's had reports of giant attacks. Um, not here, uh, it would be, oh, I don't have it open? Oh, I actually don't even have, oh yeah, I do, hold on, here we are, um, it would be over here, so, this Patchwood Forest right here, yeah, let me draw a circle out for you, Patchwood Forest right here, is right here, uh, this is the, this is a continuation here of the Patchwood Forest you saw in the, uh, the other picture. Um, these aren't exact scale, you know, drawing is what it is. It's a little bit of a margin of error. Um, that night that they discussed that with Amber and he says things are kind of getting weird out there. Um, they hear that, they hear the city bells going off, uh, like an attack on the city and, um, a strange mist starts to appear on the ground. They find out later that nothing happens to the party. They miss the action, but they find out later that uh, undead were crawling out of the river that runs through the city and attacking random passers-by. The guards put down the insurrection. It was only maybe a couple dozen undead. Very weak. But it was definitely not normal, and they, the party learns that uh, there are legends of this happening, like, hundreds of years ago to the city when it was in its first like, uh, I don't know, genesis, the genesis of the city. Like, and it was just beginning... Uh, there was this this strange occurrence that happened, and they don't remember how it got fixed or what was going on with it, but they know that they've never seen magic like this, you know, ever, probably in their whole lives, most of these people, because magic's been gone for about 600 years at this time since the tower, since the spire was built and detonated, which I will probably have to explain in a different episode. Um, they... Decide to go. Amber explains that since he's not the captain of the city watch, he's leaving. He doesn't care about this going on. He thinks it's not a big deal. It's just, it's weird. He he doesn't like magic, but he thinks that uh, uh, it's better left to the city watch, the people in charge of the justice, and other adventuring groups and mercenaries that they can hire. They will get to the bottom of it. He's confident, and he doesn't want to miss his uh, <laughs> his time in the light. In the uh, yeah, so they head south with Amber. Uh, I believe they take the road this time so because it's quite the big entourage. They've got um, they've got guards, they've got servants, they've got all kinds of things because this is the Northern Highlands um, uh, representation within the actual uh, within the Olympics, the Grand Tournament. So uh, it's a big party of people, all of different skill sets, and fairly well guarded. Lots of money on board, uh, and all that. So they head down here. And uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, they go. So this is the bottom. Remember, this is like 
a couple hundred miles under the Northern Highlands to the left a little bit, or to the west, I'll say. So we have the Northern Highlands. This right here, this is kind of like, this is, above, this is above the Bone Sea, and the Bone Sea at the bottom here, you can see Helmfirth. Um, that's like right over here-ish area. Can you see that? It's like right over here on the map. So it's pretty close. So this is kind of a continuation down. It's a peninsula. Uh, it's named the Gold Peninsula since this is like part of the... So the Human Empire would be like right where this file uh, system is right over here. It'd be like right around in here, the main human capital city. So this is a fairly populous, um, sort of well-civilized land. There isn't like orc hordes running through the area. Um... So they head through South Baywood. They find out that there, um, there's been some kind of weird, strange occurrence that happened on the Acadian Islands since they left. They hear about some kind of ritual sacrifice, which has to do with a, uh, well, I can't say because my other players might see this. Uh, in fact, my other players are pretty much the only people who will see this. So <laughs> they head down to, uh, they head through Sandwall, stay the night, all these things, head down Coastal Way to Westreach. And in Westreach, um, when you think of Westreach, think of, in terms of style, think of Breville from Oblivion. Um, wooden housing, sort of ramshackle, uh, lower end in terms of financials, um, mostly artisans, um, some merchants. It's not a walled city by any means. It's not a populous city. It's like a, it's a, it's a town. It's a nice little town. Um. In that town, they find about about a uh, Vorukov. Vorukov, they've heard of before, but they find out there's a museum for it there and a shop. So they're in my world. Tieflings. Uh, I felt like tieflings. Tieflings come from their, the whole reason they exist in the world is because of Vorukov and what happened there. So the human empire back when the big war was happening, about 600 and some and a couple years before them, uh, humans were basically on being attacked from. Down here, the elves were pushing up into their territory, and across the ocean, the dragonborn were pushing over and pretty much sandwiching them between two, one very powerful navy and standing army that, he, that had wyverns that could actually do a little bit of air force, and then the elves, who were excellent archers, uh, very skilled warriors, have been around a long time, and they were basically the magic power in the world. They were the best at it, because they'd been around the longest, they had the longest time to learn it. Um, so humans were getting pretty much squeezed real tight. And uh, one of the solutions to that was Vorukov came up with a way to, this is kind of like, use their warlock's powers, use their communication with uh, the evil gods to kind of gain some insight into ability to harness demonic power. And to spare you the details, it doesn't go very well. Uh, a lot of them get corrupted, and the humans who went through all these rituals and did all these things, basically this whole city uh, pretty much became corrupted, and that's where you get tieflings today. They all come from this place, um, this event. And I suppose I suppose you could have some leeway to say that the other methods by which you could corrupt a human being, you could make a tiefling. It would have to be a first-generation tiefling, though. So in my world, uh, tieflings get more and more and more demonic the lower the generation so first generation tieflings would be people that live there and they have a different they have different stats than so than uh than like a 12th generation tiefling so our current tiefling um adelaide she's like a 12th generation tiefling she looks almost human her skin is human she has horns but other than that and the weird pupils you wouldn't really know she's much different than a normal person um, first generation tieflings you can definitely tell they are not a normal person they have very harsh uh, edges to their skin. Um, other defining factors, so like if they, some of them have like nasty, evil looking horns, their eyes are evil, they give a certain air, they have more fangs than they do normal human teeth. Some of their noses are just gone, it's just like the Voldemort thing. Um, so they have a lot more harsh demonic features, which is how you can discern generations. So also first generation tieflings, have a uh, have sort of like de more demonic blood, and so they live a, a longer life. Um, like twelfth generation tieflings live about the length of time that a human might. Uh, first generation tieflings, as far as the party knows so far, they're they're still around. They're kind of like ghouls from Fallout. Uh, they can live very very long, uh, very very long. Uh, they met one there that was a first. I think it was a first or a third generation tiefling. Might have been a first generation tiefling. 
and uh, she, I forget her name, starts with an S. Uh, she runs a shop there, and she sells basically cursed items from Vorikov. She's very upfront. She's like, these are cursed, they're awful, but you can buy them if you'd like them. And the party, of course, does. Uh, our, our monk there buys uh, some kind of blood-soaked tapestry and uses them as hand wraps for, like, a bonus. Um, the party doesn't know what's going on with that, so I won't talk about it yet, but uh, it's getting worse. Um... Uh, after they're done in, in Westreach, I should have been drawing this, so they came, woo, all the way down here, through Sandwall, South Baywood, down Coastal Way, into Westreach, they heard about Vorikoth, which is over here, it's this whole island, and then they started cutting across country to Oakvale, which right here is where the tournament is held, Oakvale's here, uh... Oakvale, I got the name from Fable, again, but it is not like Fable at all. Um, so yeah, the tournament's like right here, in between Ramshorn Forest, Telmira, and Sleeping Forest, West Reach, and Oakvale. It's kind of in between all these. And it's got, it's, to the normal passerby, in the middle of a plains, there's this huge coliseum just out there for no reason. If you didn't know what you were looking, if you didn't know about what it was used for, what this specific site was used for, people would be very surprised to find it. Um, but they head there, um, so they find... That uh, Renwald would like to see them while they're there. He'd like they want they Renwald would like them to bring. I can't get this off. Uh, well, that's a shame. Okay, on the screen for you guys. Totally is. Oh, that's a bummer. Meh. Maybe if I draw over it, you think? You think that'll do it? Might do it. Uh, so that'll be there forever, and uh, that's that's unfortunate. Uh, they find out that um, there's definitely a, a lot of racism in this world. Um, that's not because I have these views. That's because it's the Middle Ages, and it's immersive. Uh, people have a natural tendency to dislike people that aren't like them, especially at this time period. Um, the party can have an effect on that. Hopefully they do. Um... So the elves are pretty much hated. The dragonborn are hated just about, if not the same, more. Um, especially here where the where the dragonborn really were hurting this coast. Um, they go through a couple battles. They win a few battles. The competition goes okay. The party eventually loses on all fronts, but they do win. Uh, they do win some winnings. Um, they take Amber to Renwald and. They have a little conversation outside the party's ear earshot. Uh, at the end of it, Amber uh, explains that uh, Renwald explains that the party should go ahead and help Amber with the giant issue, which is um, to to give away a little bit of my DM brain. It's a low level thing that keeps them away from the big overarching main quest and and kind of gets them ready to deal with some of the higher end stuff later on. Um, it's also Storm King's Thunder, so. That makes it easier, <laughs> which is why I have all those names from from Theron up at the top. It's because I initially planned on making my own Storm King's Thunder, and then I made my own campaign. Because sometimes when you're a DM and you're like, "Oh, I could create this uh, this thing over here, and maybe that thing over there, and maybe I should make some people that live there too," then you start um, y your brain shatters into a million pieces, and then while you're picking up the pieces, uh, you decide you you find that all these ideas were there that weren't before. <laughs> And so I, I, that's where this whole world came from. Um, oh, look at that. It's only 18 minutes. Oh, no, it's 19 minutes. So actually, we have some more time than I thought we did. Oh, well. Off script time. Um, so the end of the... Uh, they're getting more and more of an indication that Renwald is, one, a dick, and two, very, very powerful. Like, way more powerful than any mage has any right to be. Um... Uh, he, um, there's like a little, I do a little cutscene where off of, off camera, the party finds that, uh, he gets attacked by some, like about 50 black cloaked figures, him and the rest of the four horsemen. Um, and he calls down a meteor storm, a meteor swarm, which is a ninth level spell, but Renwald is able to cast it at a much higher spell level because it rains more meteors than it would normally. Um... 
So the party is in the Coliseum watching Amber do his one-on-one -on -one fight when meteors start to just rain down on the market district of the uh, of the fairgrounds, and then they know something's wrong. Some of them run towards it. Uh, Jethro uh, runs to the stable, steals a horse, and runs away. Uh, Davy does that too. That's our barbarian. Um, the I feel like some people did something different. No, I think the rest of them ran towards the conflagration. I think that's the right word. Uh, the rest of the party runs towards the danger. Um, they they get there after the fighting's already over. So they get there. Uh, Renwald is suddenly nice, um, which is odd. He starts treating the party with kindness and respect. Offers them a drink. Explains to them that you guys go ahead. We'll handle. I'll handle this. Head north. Go deal with the giant thing. Don't worry about it. Take a break. Which is real weird for Renwald. Um, other than that, the party head down to Oakvale. They find out that Oakvale is turning away all refugees because Oakvale hates company. Oakvale is um, I'll do a look. I'll do all these location videos later, so I won't explain Oakvale very much. But it's like a vacation spot for the super rich. So it's like it's like a chance for the super rich people to rough it, quote unquote. Um, it's just a really pretty area, just naturally. Uh, the party passed through there. Um, oh, uh, at this point we lose our rogue. Um, our rogue doesn't die. Uh, this is just kind of like the player who's playing, who was playing the rogue had never played a real D and D game before. And, and like, and I feel like, like most beginner players, they, they took a more, um, uh, conflict, conflict heavy character type. Uh, by that, I mean like the, I feel like new players have a proclivity to choose the type of play type of character that they don't get to be in normal life i.e. a little bit of a dick. Um, I, I myself do that, I think. And I shouldn't. It's sort of annoying. But um, I don't think they meant it to, be, to go that way, but it was definitely at odds with the party in terms of personality. So we, we thought it would be best for, the, for her to pick up a more like party-friendly character. Um, and it's been great, really great. So that character is Momo who they pick up and the tournament. Uh, they find her under a burned up tent next to her, the, what they find, what they sort of assume is the corpses of her family and brother. And it's really sad. Uh, she is actually a noble, like very rich noble from here, Vanarad South. And I won't get into that place because it's just like, it's basically the most racist, most elitist hellscape. But she's lived there, so she doesn't really know it. And she's a noble, so she hasn't really experienced it. But we head on from Oakvale through the Slumbering Hills, which are starting to... So like the Sleeping Forest and the Slumbering Hills, they are this way. These used to be... These two places used to be kind of like a magic-saturated area. When the magic all went away, um, they were renamed from the Telmiran Forest. And, and uh, I forget what the name of these hills was before. Uh, the Ramshorn Hills, the Oaken Hills, something like that. They got renamed um, after about 50 years from the the incident to the Telmiran Sleeping Forest and the Slumbering Hills because the magic header has was gone. So, i.e. it was, I clicked something, i.e. it was asleep. So they head through there and our sorcerer, Momo, who's her kind of, her thing is that she's kind of not very good at controlling her magic starts to have trouble controlling your magic because I feel like in my world there are two ways you can become a powerful wizard. You have um, you have this pool of magic, this mana pool, if you will, that you can draw from, and you can either you can focus on gaining power and getting a larger mana pool, or you can get better at casting and take a smaller amount from the mana pool to do your spells. Those are the two ways you become powerful as a mage, and I feel like a, as a sorcerer, and her, her magic is like innate. In that way, since there's so much saturated magic around her now, with the with the hills and the forest coming back to life, she has trouble. I had her roll a couple times while she was traveling through there to like roll on the wild magic table because she can't control it and, and just stuff just starts happening. Uh, which was really fun. Nothing crazy on the wild magic table. I don't think there's anything that's like gonna ruin your day, um, but it, it was it was fun. Uh, they head through here. I don't think they go through Springvane, but they come down into the White Forest. And then through White Frost. White Frost is uh, where basi it's basically like the Uber slums. Um, 
all the poor people from the main city get kind of put here to work all the farms around. This is like kind of like this is also a kind of a hub for the thieves guild. Um, it's also called White Frost because there is a uh, uh, there's a kind of um, spore that grows on these mountains, and the wind drift puts it like right in the path of White Frost. Uh, however, the spore is uh, edible, and people can kind of create little catchers to catch large amounts of the spore, and they basically eat it like mashed potatoes, because <laughs> they're so poor. It's really, uh, I'm, I got a problems in my brain, man. I come up with this stuff. Um, but they head through <laughs> White Frost on their, they head uh, from Oakvale, Slumbering Hills, through white, they head all the way across country. They don't get accosted on their way there. I mean, they do have a slight uh, little fight, but they, the people who attempt to make a problem for them soon realize they are way outmatched and they run away. Um, then we get to, what time is it? Okay, we're good. Uh, then we get to, so the party has decided they want to go to libraries, main places of knowledge, to kind of get a handle on what's going on. Because so far, they know that there are these weird purple-eyed folks, Renwald, uh, there's the Void Dragon, which they find out is actually fate, like actually fate, the god of fate, who lived on the Astral Sea until he was imprisoned in that, fo uh, in that area around the fog wall, like inside the fog wall in the Spire's um, containment area, I'll say. He's stuck there. Um, there's too much to explain right now in terms of that. Uh, what's the fourth? The fourth is... Uh, I don't think the party knows about it. I would love to say it. Um, if you're a party member of mine, you will not listen to the next two words I say. In three, two, one, don't listen. The Mystic Order. Okay, you can listen again. Um, so those four, uh, are all vying for... They all want the Spire for different reasons. Um, they all want to do something to it or whatever. And they find out that the spire is important because it's built on magical ley lines that I got this from Matt Mercer, uh, critical role, great show. Uh, I got this from Matt Mercer, uh, magical ley lines that run through the world, uh, where points converge is, is like a place of power. And this place where the spire is built is where many magical ley lines converge. Um, the spire is built there to kind of pool up all that magical energy to do amazing, masterful spells that I've never seen before. Uh, during the war is when it was allowed to be built because it was so expensive that no one wanted to build it. Uh, Renwald it convinced people back then. They find out Renwald is that old. Uh, he convinced people to build it as a military weapon, um, to which he used for great effect. He used like massively powerful control weather spells to decimate the navy of the Dragonborn, massively powerful blight spells to decimate the elves on land uh, he basically while the tower was operational it cost the it cost the enemy probably like a million people uh combined with either side uh so very very bad for all of um sentient life uh they find out that this place is extremely powerful and that it may not have been intended purpose for um, doing those spells in the first place. They think that it might have actually been for something else, uh, something maybe more sinister. Uh, but they know these four, these four factions want the tower for different reasons, and they are trying to figure out what those reasons might be. They're also trying to learn about their enemies, which is great. I also kind of poked them in that direction because I thought that would be helpful for them. Uh, so they're heading to the Empire, the main human capital city, where Renwald lives and where the main mages guild is, to go to the library there and try to research, which they do pretty effectively. Um, they, to spare you the details, they research for a long time. I cannot summarize all the things they learned because they learned quite a bit. And at the end of learning all this stuff, they decide that, oh, damn. You know what? Yeah, it's 29 minutes. Ah. So they joined the Monster Hunting Guild a while back, and they're called, their party is called the Blacksmiths, mainly because they murdered a blacksmith in their first uh, day of playing D&D. &D. Um, they're a fun bunch like that. They like to be proud of the gruesome murders they commit. Um, the party for the Monster Hunting Guild they joined go ahead and hunt some witches, which are just to the, just to the east of the city in the forest there, 
I may have, I probably do, Central Plains West, should be it, yeah. And these woods over here, let me get the pen out. And these woods over here, somewhere in here, these this witch coven is there. Uh, they're not a big threat, but the uh, guild has been asked to take care of them, mostly for the hunters here that provide food for the city and for Pencurth, which is close to the, to the woods. They're kind of a nuisance more than they are like a direct threat. So the party goes and deals with them. While they're there, they find out that the party, um, or they find out the witches have created something called an Inferi, um, which is uh, a strange creature that has pale skin, blood red hair, blood red eyes. It's not a tiefling. It's my own thing. Um, and it was created by from like a normal human. They see a person, this, this young girl, gets sacrificed, and then that sacrificial victim, that body, turns into this Inferi. With the same name, same... Yeah. So they're trying to figure out what she's all about. But they find her, bring her back, and then they leave the city. Um, they also meet a... Ah, oh shit, it's 30 minutes. 31 minutes. There's so much. There's so much that's happened. You know what? We're going to have to pick it up on another episode. Um, I'll leave you guys with when they get back to the city. So when, so they, when they get back to the city from getting um, the Inferi, Margaret... We will pick it up when they get back to the city, and then we'll do stuff from there. Okay. Uh, yes, I will see you later. We'll pick it up when we get back to the city. All right, see ya.